Coming up, angst-ridden priests, the name of the beast, and blue vein cheeks. God, those are some approximate rhymes. Shut it. Also, a real-life class in defense against the dark arts, answers to our acolytes' burning questions, and drinking with the devil. It's usually a game. This time, it's a public service. All this and more on this ritualistic episode of Kiss the Goats. X, and this is Kiss, Kiss the, the Goat. Goat. Once again, the ridiculously heavy wooden doors of the shrine to satanic cinema have swung open wide. Light the candles, draw a circle on the floor, then sit in it. Choose your favorite salty snack and let the ritual begin. What if they prefer a sweet snack, like some candy or a cold tub of yogurt? Well, I mean, that's acceptable. It's not perfect, but I'll allow it. I mean, I don't even like to eat during movies, really. People eat popcorn while the movie plays, and that's just so distracting. Like, all I can hear is the horrible crunching inside my head. (laughs) It's like the telltale snack. I mean, I'd rather drink. But, you know, now that movie theaters are starting to open back up, I can't wait to go back to the movies with my pockets stuffed full of airplane bottles of liquor. Dude, yes. One time I was able to sneak an entire handle of vodka and a medium veggie pizza into a midday showing of Coraline. I've got a great idea. I mean, we got Stephanie now. We could make her sneak everything in. Food, booze, maybe some fireworks. (laughs) Well, I mean, we could, but I'm not sure where she's going to hide all of it. Pockets only hold so much, you know, and the last thing I want is for Stephanie to start trying to pull an airplane bottle of rum out of her asshole during the previews. Okay, wait. You don't want to watch Stephanie pull a bottle out of her ass? I mean, I would. I mean, I would watch, you know. The previews kind of suck anyway. I just don't want to drink anything that has come out of her ass. That's just, just, no. No. Okay, okay. Well, we'll talk about that later. That's fine. I'm just saying it's possible, and it's an option that we should take advantage of. So, how did you sneak booze into the Theater X? Oh, I stuck those little bottles up my... I mean, in my... With... Hey, this is episode 54, Kiss the Goat, and welcome <laughs> to it. We'll be talking about a film that people have wanted us to cover for years during movie time. We're also going to be drinking. Answering your questions, making a potentially obscene phone call, and drinking. But right now, it's time for The Devil in the Details, our roundup of snippets of Satan stuff. I feel like we've talked about this before on the show. I could be wrong. I went back through a few episodes that I've got on the hard drive. I didn't hear it. Maybe I just knew about it through various nights of of research, but the Roman Catholic Church actually offers exorcism classes every year at the Vatican. They will literally teach you how to perform the entire exorcism ritual. It's called the Course on Exorcism and Prayer of Liberation, and the Vatican has been holding the classes for over 15 years. So I guess this is kind of like getting the divine seal of approval on your exorcism. Like, yes. you may have had your own exorcism ritual that you and your grandma came up with one night during a CSI marathon, but is it really going to pass the critical eye of the clergy? Hmm. So in 2019, the Cathals opened up the course to include members of other religions, Anglicans, Pentecostals, whoever, I guess. But you have to speak Italian. I mean... It's the fucking Vatican. They're not going to translate for you. They still hold masses in Latin, for crying out loud. It just fascinates me that, for one thing, this particular piece of religiosity is still alive. 
And one would think that with all the research into mental health issues, that people would lose interest in the idea that people are possessed by the devil, and that's why they do certain things. Well, but one of the great uses of Satan is that you can use him as the scapegoat for everything. Does your kid like rock and roll music? It's the devil. Has your husband suddenly shown an interest in wearing your panties? It's the devil. Has your daughter started wearing a wolf costume around the house and asked for a butt plug with a tail on it for her birthday? She must be possessed. It's like just normal shit that people do. But if it somehow falls outside of your religious or societal purview, or if it's something you just plain don't understand and are too much of a chicken shit to do your own fucking research and arm yourself with information, then why not haul them in for an exorcism? Cast the demon out! It'll make everything better! Now, this isn't necessarily Catholic exorcisms. I mean, I guess maybe some. You hear more about non-Catholic exorcisms gone wrong. Those are mostly conducted by people who are allegedly ministers of the Christian God, and they take things into their own hands and start doing homebrew exorcisms by themselves, and it seems like they'll do an exorcism on anybody. It's like a barber shop. Walk-ins, welcome. Take a seat. Now, a lot of times, those exorcisms end horribly and tragically. This past March in Sri Lanka, two people were arrested after the subject of an exorcism died after the ritual. The mother of the exorcism victim believed that her daughter was possessed by a demon and took her to a local woman who had done exorcisms before. Now, according to the Associated Press, the first thing the exorcist did was pour oil on the girl. Then the exorcist began hitting the girl with a cane. So when the girl passed out from being constantly battered with a hunk of wood, she was taken to local medical facility, and she died as a result of her injuries. People, that girl is nine years old. Now, I don't mean to swerve everybody and get grim because this is, at its heart, a comedy show. We like to have fun and drink and say naughty things. But one of the things that we have always, since we started the show back in 2014, always railed against is the act of exorcism. More often than not, it's sensationalistic, and it's done for the main reason of embiggening the ego of the exorcist. Yep. Remember, kids, exorcists are everywhere. Remain vigilant, and don't get suckered by those sick fuckers. It's about spectacle. It's about control. And most of all, it's about money. Your money. Well, that's going to do it for this episode's Devil in the Details, which weirdly fits in with this episode's movie, which is one, about exorcism classes, and two, is super serious. Is this going to be another one of those thought-provoking episodes, like when we talked about The Exorcism of Emily Rose, which is a movie I still don't like and you still don't not like? Well, no, wait, I like it. Well, that's what I said. Good gods, I'm glad I started drinking early. Okay, dial it back. Shh. It's movie time. This episode's movie is The Right from 2011, an exorcism flick starring Sir Anthony Hopkins as the old priest and Colin O'Donoghue as the young priest. It also features Toby Jones as the short priest. He's like five foot five. Is that short? Honey, I am taller than Toby Jones. He's a great actor. He's a short man. Well, this movie is allegedly based on true events. The source material is a book by Matt Baglio, also called The Right, based on his experiences in Rome, where he was sent to be trained as an exorcist. The Right was produced by Bo Flynn and Trip Vinson, who also produced The Exorcism of Emily Rose. Ah, since Emily Rose, <laughs> Flynn has produced a bunch of movies for Dwayne Johnson, which automatically makes him one of my favorite people. The movie was directed by Mikhail Hofstrom, and I'm probably butchering that name all the hell. But he also directed the Stephen King adaptation 1408, which a lot of people really enjoyed. I was not one of those people. But I have to admit that Hafstrom does have a certain amount of cinematic flair, and that's visually evident in the ride. Now, like I said, the ride come out in 2011, and I can't remember. Does that fall within our spoiler time frame? I mean, this is one of the more recent movies we've covered. <sighs> Fuck, I don't remember what our spoiler time frame was either. And honestly, I'm not sure I care. 
I mean, if we were covering something that came out like last week, I would worry about it because I don't want to spoil the experience for anybody. But that being said, the right is 10 years old. Additionally, I think that a majority of our audience have figured out how to work the fast forward button on whatever media platform they choose to listen to KTG on. So what you're saying is... What I'm saying is, if you don't want to have the right spoiled from hell to breakfast, skip this segment. If you do, then continue listening. I mean, it's really kind of simple, y'all. That seems fair and rational. Well, I'm a rational human. Well, then, let's rationally dig into the right, shall we? (laughs) We shall. Now, the right is not a terribly complicated story. Right. There's Michael Kovac, who's played by Colin O'Donoghue. He's the son of a mortician, played by Rutger Hauer. And Kovac decides to go to seminary. It seems like a good way to get an education, and it beats all hell out of joining the family business. But after four years of seminary, Kovac decides to bugger out of the priesthood because he has a certain lack of faith. So Kovac sends an email to the father superior, Toby Jones, who's a great actor but a short man. And says, I got to go. I'm sorry. This has been a great time, but I'm getting the hell out of Dodge. Now, upon receiving the email, Father Superior jumps the gun, and he chases Michael into the rainy street to discuss Michael's decision to not proceed with his vows. The priest trips. He bumps into a woman riding a bicycle, and that woman gets pushed in front of a truck. Although he's not a priest yet, Michael gives the woman the last rites, which weirdly impresses the father superior. And he later tells Michael that should he decide not to become a priest, that the seminary could convert his scholarship funds over into a student loan. Now, if that were to happen, Michael would be left with more than a hundred grand in debt, which makes our student loan debt look pretty fucking great, to be honest. <laughs> it does. And I want to interject here real quick. So, one, I got the impression that Michael was not joining the seminary just because he didn't want to be a mortician. It felt to me the lead up to that was that he wanted to escape. He wanted to get away, and that was the only way that he knew how. Didn't have the money to go to university on his own. Didn't really, I guess, have the skills to get a scholarship to go to university on his own. So that was kind of his out. I need to get away from dad. I need to get away from the same old, same old and experience some new shit. And then two, that scene where he did the last rites. Actually, I thought that was pretty moving. That was one of the, no, not one of the, I think that was the best bit of acting that that guy did in the entire fucking movie. The character felt flat for me and everything else that he did, except for that scene. It was poignant and it felt touching, and it, it it he actually conveyed to me that he was a character that had a heart. So that was kind of cool. Okay, now I'm not Catholic, and you know this, but I'm not even sure that what he told that woman was actually the last rites. Oh, well, I'm not either. I have no idea. I mean, but... I, th- I think he was just winging that shit. It didn't sound like what Father Dyer said to Father Karras at the bottom of the steps. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. It felt very unorthodox to me, too. But he sat there in the pouring rain holding her hand and saying words of comfort to her in her last moments. So that was pretty cool. Okay, I get that. I get that. But the third thing was that whole thing about, well, if you decide to leave, it felt like fucking blackmail. (laughs) Like, okay, yeah, sure, you can bail now, but you're going to owe the church a hundred thousand fucking dollars, so. And we're going to constantly be trying to get in touch with you about your warranty for your vehicle. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, he almost didn't have a choice at that point, which is kind of shitty. But I think that's one of the points of the movie, too, is is the uh, conflict of predestination versus free will. Ugh. <laughs> That old chestnut. God damn. So anyway, Father Superior suggests that Michael go to Rome to take a class on exorcism, which is being held at the Vatican. Now, if after that he decides not to be a priest, 
then so be it. But Father Superior's like, they've told me to watch out for people who might be great exorcists, and you seem to fill that bill after talking to that woman who was dying in the street. I'm not positive how those two things coalesce. It but, seems like a weird criteria. You'd think maybe, oh, he would be good for hospice work. Right? <laughs> or but, something. Yeah, well, you're gonna be an you're gonna be an exorcist kid. Yeah, this sounds great. This is this is your career path. Fucking Catholic Phoenix University bullshit. Anyway, Michael goes to Rome and he's up there at the Vatican and he's taken the classes, which he's late for the first one, but because of his willful clashes with the priest conducting the exorcism class, Michael is sent to meet one Father Lucas, who is a Welsh Jesuit played by Sir Anthony Hopkins. Now, <laughs> I wanted him to do that so bad through the whole movie. I wanted him to eat a bowl of fava beans, and it didn't happen. So upset. Oh, my God. I wish everybody could have seen your face when you made the noise. <laughs> no. I should have taken a fucking stab shot of that. That was great. Oh, my God. All right. So Michael, Father Lucas, and um, Lucas being an exorcist, the guy who's given the classes at the Vatican says he uses unorthodox methods. Okay, well, Lucas is working with this pregnant 16-year-old girl named Rosaria, and she claims to be possessed. Now, Michael's not so sure, because it comes out that the girl was raped by her father, and Michael is convinced that that traumatic act is what's causing the girl to act as if she has the devil inside of her. Oh, and that would certainly do it. Jesus Christ. Well, it would. It's 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 pretty awful. But, okay, here's where the right kind of breaks down for me, okay? Because at this point, I think we're where? We're maybe beginning the second act, maybe the middle of it by the time yeah. we meet Rosaria. Yeah. So really the right breaks down into maybe three separate actual things that happen, okay? There's Michael going to Rome, mm -hmm. Michael meets Father Lucas and Rosaria, and then in the third act, Father Lucas gets possessed. <laughs> That's really all that happens in this fucking movie. Just as a side note, though, I'm wondering, does unorthodox mean constantly looking like he's left his wallet laying somewhere because that's what anthony hopkins looks like in portraying this character like he's constantly stopping and looking around and like patting like if he had pockets and then been like okay and then walking out the room oh he's <laughs> he's super twitchy he's super twitchy during this entire movie and it kind of freaks me out Mm -hmm. So Michael deals with Father Lucas and Rosaria, who may or may not be possessed. Now, at one point, Rosaria starts talking in English and saying, you know, devil stuff. But the thing that's really interesting to me is she, during an exorcism session, she actually vomits three nails, mm -hmm. which is obviously a crucifixion of Christ shout out. Yeah, and they were like the old-fashioned, like, square-type nails. Yeah, they were like ten-penny nails. They were, they, yeah. they, were, they were really big, so that's interesting to me. But there's still the question of whether or not Rosaria was actually possessed, because every time Father Lucas says, nope, she's got the devil in her, Michael's like, well, no, here's another explanation as to why she's behaving this way. Yeah, he keeps trying to find the rational explanation, which, I mean, is good. You really kind of want that. <laughs> you do, you do. And long story short, they try to exercise Rosario like, what, like four times during the movie? I think so, three to four times, yeah. And Father Lucas is like, well, this could take months. And I'm like, mm -hmm. how do you keep your fucking job? Yeah, it's just like weird short bursts of exorcism. <laughs> if I told my boss, look, this spreadsheet is just possessed by the devil, but it's going to take months in order to obtain spiritual liberation for this Excel cell. Nobody else would buy that. You can't, you can't do that in the real world. Is 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 my thing. Right. No, I agree, and it makes him seem rather inept. Inept and twitchy. Inept and twitchy. Yeah, but I I <laughs> honestly didn't really like his character until he got possessed. So the first indication that we have that the padre is now possessed by a demon is. He goes out 
wandering in nothing but his overcoat, right? Like you can and a see hat. his he's wearing, and a hat. He's wearing a yeah. hat. You could see his bare ass legs sticking out from under the coat, and you could see his bare ass chest from you know above the the lapel. And he's in a park, and he's standing there mumbling something to himself, and he's like overlooking, I guess like a. I think it's Vatican City. Oh, is it? I think okay, he so can it, see Vatican City from his vantage point. He's kind of like on a hill or a rise of some sort, and he's looking down at the Vatican City, mumbling to himself. And this little girl, about five or six years old, comes up and says, Bless my dolly, Father. Father, bless my doll. Like She asks him like three times, and he, t- he stops, and he looks down at her. And he straight up pimp slaps this little five-year-old girl. Just knocks her ass to the ground and then just walks off. Got to keep your Jesus hand strong. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> so, and he ends up going back to his parish or whatever and sitting in the courtyard in the rain um, until uh, Michael Kovac comes and finds him and takes him inside. And then that's when they discover that he's been possessed because. He starts talking some crazy shit. Okay, but. now now let's 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 kind of run back on this because okay. after we watched the movie, you told me that the movie didn't really start to work for you until Father Lucas got possessed in the third act. Yeah, I disagree. Okay. I think the first two acts work a lot better when Father Lucas was just this weird motherfucker tromping around Rome, you know, trying to get his motorbike fixed. Well, I think what I meant by it didn't really work for me is that I was bored out of my fucking mind until (laughs) he got possessed by a demon. Because then it was like, okay, here here is the Anthony Hopkins that I was wanting. Here is the crazy motherfucker with the devil eyes and the fucking veins popping all over his face and spewing obscenities and getting in people's faces and bitch slapping little children. Okay, okay, let me let me interrupt here. So I want to go back to old formatting for the show, okay? <laughs> okay. Is The Right a devil movie? Oh, fuck no. Okay, good. Okay. Because to me, this is far less a devil movie and more of a person grappling uh, with their Christian faith. But I think had it been marketed more as a drama, which for the first two acts, it really is, instead Mm -hmm. of a horror movie, it wouldn't have made near as much money. But it's just not a horror movie at its center. And when Father Lucas gets possessed... We get all these weird ass tropes. There's like there's fucking frogs everywhere, and there's upside down crosses floating, and his eyes change color, and his veins start popping out. Yep. Um, I just don't think it helps the movie overall. I mean, when Father Lucas gets possessed, and he's the devil's talking through him, he calls Michael kissy lips. Yeah. <laughs> it is, was funny though. Is that all you got, motherfucker? Kissy lips. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how I would react if something called me kissy lips, but it probably wouldn't be to begin an exorcism ritual. (laughs) Kissy lips. Oh, my God. Okay, so the Italian girl who was carrying her father's baby and who was possessed, maybe or not, she dies. And the baby dies. So, you know, everybody kind of washes their hands of that shit, like... Whew, thank God we don't have to deal with that anymore. But it's after she dies in the movie that Father Lucas gets possessed. So my question is, why did Father Lucas get possessed? Was it because Rosaria died? No, I think that because – and he mentioned this earlier in the film. And, of course, this is just my opinion about this. But he did mention it earlier in the film that he had lost people before to exorcism. And that it sent him into a depression and that he began to question his faith. So I think that this demon or whatever exploited that and found a way in when he became depressed over Rosaria's death. Well, I don't think that makes him any different than Father Marin, do you? No, not at all. No. I I mean, it, it makes him human. So we're going on guilt of... 
people that he's lost during an exorcism before, and probably Rosario was just the, you know, hemorrhaging cherry on top of that particular guilt Sunday. Mm -hmm. So if he got possessed because of guilt, then doesn't that indicate that guilt is the source of most so-called possession cases? And if that's the case, wouldn't he have been better off with a shrink? You know what? That is an awesome point, and I 100% agree with you. Because, and it's one of the cornerstone foundational problems that I have with the religion as a whole, is that so much of it is founded on guilt. We are all guilty of original sin. We are all sinners. And and if we had a dollar bill for all the things we'd done, there'd be a mountain of money piled up to our chest. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, and that's palpable. And the fear of going to hell is palpable, and it's very real to the people that, that buy into that faith, hook, line, and sinker. At least, you know, iterations of it, I think, uh, you know, my personal opinion, too, is that the, the modern-day Christian church is a far cry from Jesus' teachings. But, um, yeah, I, I agree 100%. Guilt is a huge factor in that, and I think that all, if not – the majority of these exorcism cases can be boiled down to something that that person has has built this huge anxiety and this huge complex around f feelings of guilt. Which kind of leads into my next question about the movie. Does Satan need some kind of entrance point, like a, a crack in the armor, in order to possess a person? Because Okay, it seems like there are a fucking lot of possessed people in Rome. Okay. Yeah. How many movies have we seen about possessed people in Rome? Right? Now, <laughs> the movies we watch really tend to bear that theory out. And at the end of the ride, there's an on-screen legend that says Father Lucas performed over 3,000 exorcisms. Whereas Father no, Michael, Michael Kovac, went back to the States and did like uh, 14. Okay. I mean, I've seen demons get cast out of people during Pentecostal services. Okay, not Catholic, just mm -hmm. straight up Pentecostal evangelical. But I've always, I've always chalked that up to severe emotionalism and this kind of mass hysteria that seems to arise during Pentecostal services. So I'm wondering how much of that is guilt over something, and is that the entrance point that Satan needs, or is Satan like this weird, fucking marauding? biker who could just show up at your house, kick the door in, and take over your body and make you call people kissy lips. <laughs> um, I don't know the answer to that. All I can say is that... Um, well, I just want your opinion. I don't, I'm not looking for... No. I, well, and all I can speak from, obviously, is my own experience, and that was in a Pentecostal faith um, growing up. And I was taught that uh, the devil is constant. The devil is there, and you have to exercise constant vigilance to, to keep him out. He's and the, he's him the pacing lion waiting to devour? Mm-hmm. Okay. Did you ever have demons cast out of you? Or you don't have to answer that question. But, I mean, during a Pentecostal service, because I did. I, if somebody was trying to do that, they did not verbalize it to me. So I don't know. <laughs> Okay. For a fact. <laughs> no, that's fair. I mean, they came at me because, you know, I like to fuck. Oh. Yeah. And they tried I'm glad to... they weren't successful in casting well, that they... out. <laughs> yeah, now. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, it was like the demon of hypersexuality or something like that. And I've probably talked about this on the show before, but I used to have a pastor who broke down in front of a Sunday morning service because he liked to drink Coca-Cola. And he felt guilty about drinking a Coke. Wow. I mean, that's severe, y'all. That's just mm -hmm. like, it's it's a soft drink. It's not like you were <laughs> sucking down five bottles of J&B every day. It was a fucking Coke. <laughs> what? I know. Now, at the end, after Michael does the exorcism on Father Lucas, and I'm, if I'm spoiling shit, <laughs> what show are you listening to? Fuck you. Um... At the end, Michael makes the decision that he believes in God because he believes in the devil. Mm -hmm. Now, my question about that is, are those two questions always reciprocal? 
can you believe in God and not believe in the devil or vice versa? Oh, that's an interesting question. I think that if you do believe in God but not the devil, then you can't truly call yourself a Christian. So being a Christian depends on believing in in hell? It's in the Bible. That's fascinating. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, they're flip sides of the same coin. Okay. No, that makes that makes sense. I think I think that's a good answer. Why was the best part of the movie when Anthony Hopkins bitch slapped that kid down the fucking steps? <laughs> it was really jarring after just the kind of subtle back and forth and just really kind of subdued psychological plays throughout the entire movie. All of a sudden, you've got this old fucking <laughs> priest bitch slapping a kid. I mean, <laughs> I mean, he didn't even react. He didn't even like. Look at her. It's just a neuter to pap. I'm pretty sure he smiled as he was walking away, too. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> it's just like, la da da, I'm going for ice cream. <laughs> la la la. <laughs> All right, go back to the end of this, which I don't know. Maybe people should watch this. Maybe they should. But after Father Lucas is exercised, why does he treat it so casually? You know what I mean? It's like mm-hmm. the demon gets cast out of him, and the next thing we see, he's like, oh, yeah, I like my bike. It was a really good bike. It brought me here, and I like bikes, and you're a decent person, and bicycles, and, well, have fun, goodbye. I mean, he didn't, say, he didn't say thank you. He didn't say, let me pour you up some, you know, fucking coffee. Nothing. He was just like, yep, that's you go. Like, he treated it almost like routine, like, you know, like he just took a shit. That's what I started to say. Maybe it wasn't the first time he had been possessed. Oh, you think? You think maybe this had happened to him before? That could be a fun prequel. (laughs) It could be. (laughs) The many exorcisms of Father... What was his name? Of Father Lucas? Father Lucas, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're right, though. Hopkins took that character and just... Just talked non-fucking-stop. Just... (laughs) Well, here's a thing, and then there's a thing, and then there's a thing, and here are cats. Do you like cats? I like cats, and this is my bike. Oh, the devil, and oh, Jesus, and let's have some fun. (laughs) You made it sound like a Monty Python skit. That was great. (laughs) (laughs) I want to see that. Oh, I didn't even mean to do that. So I know it's been a while since you've watched it, but compare this maybe to The Exorcism of Emily Rose. Oh, wow. Well, I mean, there are some obvious uh, comparisons to make in that it really tried at least to explore the psychology behind possession and exorcism. I th- at first, when we when we first met Father Lucas, I felt like that he was using things to um, help trigger the people that he treated psychologically to help pull them out of that. Like maybe he was like, ah, you're not really possessed by a demon. Oh, look, there's a demon in the shape of a frog in your pillowcase. Okay. So now I take a frog I brought from home. Yeah. Like I packed my fucking lunch. Exactly. So he's like, okay. So I I felt like the movie kind of touched on that. It was, and of course you had Michael Kovac constantly. Oh, this person needs a shrink. Oh, this person needs psychological help, which he's not wrong. So, oh, I need an enema. <laughs> something we needed to get laid in the worst way. <laughs> I kind of wish that journalist had laid him. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, I mean, it is, it's in a similar vein, um, but I think that this movie – showed us more of the possibility of the paranormal side of things and the the possibility of actual demon possession than the exorcism of Emily Rose did. So which one do you think was more successful, this one or Emily Rose? Successful, successful in what way? Successful in A, storytelling, and B, getting across the possible existence of God and or the devil. Um, I think I have to split the difference on that because I think that this one was better at the storytelling, at least in a more entertaining way to follow. Um, Emily Rose kind of dragged and it, it got a little dry in points. And um, So you're admitting that finally. I am. And I, I don't think I ever argued that point, but um, 
as far as like showing what was the second point showing the existence of the paranormal well the paranormal or the spiritual realm in a judeo-christian sense okay i don't i think they both uh, were about equal in that respect honestly i think the right has that same kind of grounded in reality approach that Emily Rose has, mm-hmm. but I've always contended that that approach didn't work in Emily Rose. I've always thought it was a detriment, and like I've said a hundred times, it's just the worst Law & Order episode I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> but I think that approach works with the right until that third act when it takes that sharp left turn into Devil Town. It was mm-hmm. just so much better to me when it was an examination of Michael's crisis of faith, even if he was, you know, relatively non-emotive and a real fucking bore to watch, then when it became a full-on possession movie with the frogs and the mysterious charm bracelets and the kissy lips, it worked much better before that, as far as I'm concerned. So I think what's interesting is Exorcism of Emily Rose really kind of looked at that entire ritual and that event as almost, in an almost clinical fashion, yeah. Whereas the right was like, well, no, we should really have him, you know, talking in Latin backwards and speaking other languages and spitting up a nail and whatever else. It just didn't work for me, man. They didn't. They. It's like they didn't. They didn't lead up to that enough to make me happy. And him being possessed didn't make a lick of sense to me. Okay. Well, that's fair. I also think it's interesting that what you liked about this movie is kind of the core concept that I liked about The Exorcism of Emily Rose. Why didn't it work for me in that movie? Was it just the cast? Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's it, it's it's interesting to me. It's probably the framing device. The framing device, probably, and the there was no courtroom drama in this particular movie. That's good for me. But mm-hmm. I don't know, man, just because they're, they're walking on that same hallowed ground with their shoes off. But I don't know. Is one of them better than the other? I can't decide. So really, was this a divisive movie when it came out? I mean, do you remember when it came out? Did you see it in the theater or anything? Oh, Lord, no. I actually don't remember ever hearing about this before we did KTG. So. Oh, good. Another um... way I have added to your life. <laughs> It was a moderate box office success. It pulled in nearly $100 million against a $37 million budget. But ticket sales don't always indicate positive opinions. I mean, horror movies, and this was marketed as a horror movie, usually do bang up business in the first weekend of release. Mm -hmm. And then they tend to drop off real sharp after that, like 70% drop off the next weekend. Well, I mean, we could ask someone else's opinion. Yeah, but that means leaving the shrine and actually interacting with people. Well, no, let's just dial a certain three numbers and see who picks up. Oh, I like that idea. Shit. (laughs) I like that a lot. Well, let's make an outbound call on the landline of the damned and find out who's on the other end. It's time to call 666, the number of the geeks. Uh, hello? Oh, good! It's you! I'm so glad you picked up, Acolytes. This human is the host of Hello, This is the Doomed Show, which you can hear on the Legion Podcast Network. He is an author, a dilettante, and a gadabout. It's Richard Glenn Schmidt. Welcome to Kiss the Goat. Uh, Thanks for having me, but just to correct you, I am not a debutante. I didn't say debutante. (laughs) I said dilettante, which I think is something to do with pickles. Yes, I do enjoy a fresh pickle. <laughs> but no, I'm really glad to be here. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Now, before we jump into the demonic goodness or badness of the right, I need to give a little glimpse behind the scenes to our listeners out there, see how the sausage is made. Now, Cootie and I often get a little bit tipsy and record our portion of the show in one sitting. Now, because of scheduling conflicts, we often record this segment a few days after, and then I go back and I fix it in post. I just edit everything together like a professional, so it sounds seamless and beautiful as you're used to. Now, after I confirmed with Richard uh, that we would record tonight, this is Wednesday, 
I had to take Cootie to the dentist for an unscheduled procedure. Now, because of the swelling and the pain and whatnot, mm. she's not going to be on this segment. However, she's here, and she's right behind me, and I figure that if I say anything that she disagrees with, that she could just chuck a house shoe at me or something like that. So anyway, that's what's happening. So Richard, hello. You know more about Italian cinema, particularly Gialli, than any other human being that I know. So, you know, instead of calling you for one of our last two episodes, which were actually <laughs> Italian movies, because um, <laughs> why would I do anything sensible or rational? I have brought you onto an episode uh, about an American movie that takes place largely in Rome. So, in general, please tell us, what did you think about the riot? Well... I'm not going to say I didn't like it, but not turning it off after about 40 minutes was difficult. <laughs> um, I was, uh, I, I, I wasn't a fan of this film, though I did like parts of it. There are parts of it that I'm really into. The um, end credits were particularly fun. <laughs> I like the setting. I love the cinematography and the dude who directed it, I think did a good job, but the, uh, the characters were all jackasses. <laughs> like, like, especially our, our main hero, uh, freaking uh, wannabe Mr. Not priest, Michael, um, played by, I think his name is Colin O'Donoghue. Uh, O'Donoghue. That's correct. Yes. Uh, yeah, I hated his character. Maybe somebody else. Maybe somebody fun. But I, I mean, obviously, this he wasn't like a fun character either. But whatever. And then you know, uh, Anthony I'm Hopkins. So, I'm sorry. I'm trying to think of a fun priest in the right. Father Ted. I don't know. <laughs> Anthony Hopkins. He gets to do uh, Satanic Hannibal Lecter. So when he gets a little wound up, I was taken out of the movie because, I mean, I, obviously Anthony Hopkins is amazing. And he is clearly sort of committed to doing this movie somewhat. I like the lady, uh, Alice Braga, who looks like uh, Jennifer Connelly. Not Jennifer Connelly. I wish she looked like Jennifer Connelly. Jessica Harper, the other Jennifer Connelly. <laughs> <laughs> And of course, uh, one of my man crushes is in this, uh, frickin' Syrian Hines. He plays the, I, I thought he was the Pope, but I don't know the church so good. He, he may as well it. be the Pope. Wasn't he like Father Xavier? Is that, was that yes. his name? The guy who ran the exorcism classes? And the school for <laughs> gifted mutants, yes, as well. Right. And uh, frickin' Toby Jones is in it, frickin' Rutger Howard's in it. I mean, come on, the cast is great. I just wish they were in... A movie that wasn't so predictable. Woo! Yeah. Like, dude, like, imagine, like, dude, like, what if the exorcist, like, what if he gets possessed? What? That'd be fucked up, brother. What if they just start <laughs> spitting out nails, brah? Like crucifixion <laughs> nails? Like with the square heads, brah. Look, I've watched enough Josh Gates. I know that shit can happen, dude. <laughs> the fucking Amish crucified <laughs> Jesus. Don't think and they build nails. a barn. <laughs> <laughs> Don't waste the wood. God hates that. So why are Italian possession movies just so banana pants crazy? Oh, man. See, yeah, I, I love the uh, Antichrist. I love that you guys covered that. That is um, one of the weirdest. If not, well, there's the return of The Exorcist, which is, I believe, one of the ones that uh, they stopped from being shown in the States. So it got released, and because it was so... Like, It and Abby, I think, were stopped. See, now, I've seen Abby. Yeah. I'm not Return of the Exorcist is terrible. Is it uh, like the great white of Exorcist movies? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, there's the the eerie midnight horror show is another Italian one. I forget what that one's actually called. They wanted to capitalize on the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Which, in retrospect at the time, was probably not the best idea. Right. Oh, this is just called... It's just called Enter the Devil, which is boring. 
Um, and I think the title might be like The Possession or something like that. It's not good. But that eerie midnight horror show, that's hot. That's a hot title. It's right up there with Blood Sucking Freaks. And yeah, I highly recommend you guys do freaking eerie midnight horror show, especially when uh, a certain person gets possessed and then just runs through the city and then runs through the city. And then to take a break from that, she runs <laughs> through the city. <laughs> It's one of them, like, extended <laughs> sequences. Um, I'm really hoping it'll get a Blu-ray someday, because I need those street scenes restored to their glory. <laughs> I, still need a blue, I still need a Blu-ray of House with the Laughing Windows. Well, pff, everyone does. I everyone. Just, we should all be issued that when we become a citizen of this great country of I ours. I agree. I agree. In comparison to other movie exorcisms that we have seen, the one in the right seems extremely austere. Can you think of a calmer expulsion of the devil from an unwilling host? <laughs> well, you see, I loved, I loved the the creepy kid one, which wasn't really. It was like that's the thing. This is treating exorcism like the slow process that it's supposed to be. Like it's supposed to take weeks to, to or months to get somebody to be not not exercised. But these people are living their lives, and so the process really does take years like anthony hopkins character seems to be stringing them along i don't know why it takes so yeah. long so it sets up that oh these are just like little therapy sessions but then we immediately get the pregnant girl who goes completely bananas which i think is the best stuff in the movie like i was really not happy when that storyline ended i'm like Oh no! I liked her, and I liked the kid, the creepy kid that needed to be exercised as well. But yeah, th this was very, very mannered, I mean, or just polite exorcism. Yes, yes. I was never as terrified, like of course the you know the the OG Exorcist or uh, the the locus of even Exorcist Two, the heretic. <laughs> Like, I was I'm terrified of that. I'm still scared of The Exorcist after all these years. It's mainly Pazuzu. just... I can't look at that girl's fucking face. Like, <laughs> every time I'm flipping through one of those the greatest horror films of all times books, I get to Reagan's face. I have to turn the page. Like, ah, oh, God, man, it's so good. We can't top that. So the right said, we're not going to try to top that. She looks like the, the, the best clear seal commercial ever. <laughs> Just you can clear your face up with these with, with these scrubby pads and she's all um, <laughs> Ladies, have you tried holy water? <laughs> so we were talking about Sir Anthony Hopkins kind of like possessed Hannibal in this. How do you rank his performance? Because we had a difficulty with the fact that he would say sentences and not breathe in between them, and he would never pause, and he would just go on from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next, and that was his entire performance. Thank you very much. I like my bike. <laughs> I want to see the scenes of him riding that motorcycle once he's fixed it. I think that's the fastest ending in the world documentary. <laughs> yeah, I, this was um, this is easily one of my least favorites um, from him. Um, I'm in Slack and I haven't watched a movie, a lot of movies with him since like the Thor movies, sadly. Um, I, but I, I do like him. As my wife, uh, Lietta says, uh, Anthony Hopkins is inside of every woman. <laughs> and she's been saying that for years and years of our marriage. And I have never asked her what that means. Cause I, I like not knowing what that means. I think that's just best left unsolved. Mm -hmm. Unsolved and uncovered. Yeah. I mean, I mean, covered. I nah, forget it. I was never a big fan of Silence of the Lambs, so my favorite Hopkins mm. performance was Magic. Oh God! Yeah, I have, right. I haven't seen that since I was like eight when it was on TV, and I, dude, yeah, that was whew, that it's, was an experience. It's it's still scary. It nice. really is. What did this movie need, and why was it the ghost of Alita Vili? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> She was all she was all booked up for a ghost Italian horror convention. <laughs> I guess it needed a creepier tone. The stuff with Michael's um, father, with Rutger Hauer, and his, the stuff with the uh, his his profession before joining the priesthood, which was um, an embalmer in uh, their their sweet family uh, mortuary that they had. The stuff with his dad 
uh, painting the fingernails on the corpse when he's a child. And of course, I knew immediately, oh, it's his mom. His mom was a corpse once, which makes yeah. him a corpse baby, which is right. fine. But I think I think it needed a um, either more scares, more scares, it needed more scares, <laughs> or it needed... um wasn't scary enough. <laughs> I, I, it didn't tickle my fancy. <laughs> it needed some more atmosphere. And because they had a lot of atmosphere, but then it just needed to get... Get some smoke machines in that shit. I don't know. Some it's creepy in, lighting. Right? What was it missing? I don't. It's interesting to me because uh, the director, Mikhail Hafstrom, had done 1408, that Stephen King adaptation, which was yeah. essentially a bottle story. Most of it takes place in one room. And, okay. I mean, I'm not a fan of the movie, but there were more scares in that in that one room than there were that he could find in the entire city of rome and he went with the jump scares with this one and they were pitiful jump scares i'm not a big jump scare guy but i will give a movie credit if it gets me like if i get like really i will just own up to it and be like yes that scared a little pee pee out i'm not ashamed that got me these scares always involve someone getting choked suddenly (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, oh, oh, wow! Can you can you imagine? These aren't really jump scares. They're more like hiccup scares. <laughs> hop scares. Yeah, yeah, hop scares, and that's it. Was the oh. best part of this movie the scene where Anthony Hopkins bitch slapped the five year old? Yes. When Thank she's you. like, "Thank you, that's my dolly." Whoosh. That was great. Um, I I did wonder like was this that era of pg-13 and yes indeed the why does every movie have to be pg-13 um this of course didn't have any of the really uh, explicit possession stuff where they got really carried away with the the blaspheming and the cursing and everything right and i think they should have just went ahead and opened up that throttle and just had freaking anthony hopkins just spilling forth with expletives that would have been a a vast improvement i think i would have enjoyed hearing anthony hopkins say fuck me jesus as opposed to (laughs) kissy lips yes yeah i mean someone does say goodbye wiener in the movie (laughs) (laughs) but he didn't say that somebody else said that (laughs) oh Oh my my god yeah i i it just didn't work. I mean, most of this didn't work for me. I was a little surprised at the rating on IMDb that I keep staring at while we're talking. I'm like, 6.0? Really? It's a little high. It is a little high. It seems I'd a give little it a, high. I'd give it a 3.12. <laughs> Wait, was that a Bible reference? Was it, I th- was it John it 3.12? That was 316, probably. 316. Oh, damn it. That's all right. I'm oh. not sure what John 3.12 is. It's probably something about <laughs> football scores. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a favorite devil movie? Oh, ooh. Um, that's a great question. Let's see. What would be a favorite devil movie for me? Um, I am well, the aforementioned Antichrist. I am very fond of that. You guys covered something that I am a big fan of involving the devil, and that might be actually my favorite devil movie, Lisa and the Devil. God damn. Which, it might be how I got on this show. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh shit, I missed their Antichrist episode, but dude, at least on the devil, hell yeah. Started listening to it, getting into the groove, and then I was like, oh shit, <laughs> these guys hated it. <laughs> I was like, joke's on me, Mr. Schmidt. <laughs> it, <laughs> it, was, it was not our favorite. No, no, dude, it it's... Not. It is a very, very um, bava e. It is probably his most bava e movie ever. Like the only thing, like that I can't stand is what they did to it with uh, the House of Exorcism, where they took, because because I love a good Italian exorcist ripoff. I like some of the Spanish ones too, and of course you know Abby and all those. But after like the 2000s, I'm just I can't do the the Exorcist ripoffs, which I'm glad we didn't. We aren't talking about one right now. But uh, no, Lisa and the Devil, they took it and they they manipulated it into the House of the Devil. Oh no, House of the Devil. That's a totally different movie. Yeah, that's the uh, West. <laughs> that's 
That's a great movie. Uh, the House of Exorcism. And I tried multiple times to sit through it. But my love for Lisa and the, and the Devil does not include a version where Bava, in order to even get it released properly, had to film some extra exorcism scenes. And they keep too much of the Lisa and the Devil stuff, so you still have them going to the house. You still have them sitting around the dinner table having obtuse conversations. And then they cut to Alan Alda's father. Yeah, Robert Alda. <laughs> giving this piss poor, I don't want to be here either a performance of him giving exorcism. It's a train wreck, and I can't stand it. Yeah. Uh, but yes, I, Lisa and the Devil is way up there. The, the one I accidentally mentioned... Um, House of the Devil is amazing. Yeah, that's an extremely love... good movie. That's yeah. a Brad favorite. A doomed show Brad is a big fan of that. He has the poster and the videotape and probably a beautiful chest tattoo, I hope. <laughs> I, I mean, I've never seen... We're shirts on for that show. Not like tonight. Yeah, exactly. We're... I'm Starkers. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> Where you can see my beautiful Tom Noonan chest piece right here mm, yes yeah but that's last action hero tom Nooner. it doesn't really count that's the only one that counts what are you talking about? <laughs> in a god of vita honey do you have any last rights <laughs> uh, let's see I, I do have some notes um notes are good uh, i said this movie ruined the word right for me because <laughs> you know the the right right it right need, it needed some right aid not wrong aid, not that again. Exactly. Um, I like Michael's disdain for video games. His uh, his roommates are playing this really generic shoot 'em up chainsaw video, like violent video game, and he's trying to study. He's like, guys, seriously? And they have to shut the door, and and it gets instantly silent in his room, like he's in a freaking uh, like a, that chamber where <laughs> you go insane. Chamber. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Suddenly he can hear his heartbeat. <laughs> This is insane. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, the thing I didn't really... I thought this was fucking science fiction, dude. The church, like Toby Jones is this priest. Uh, he uses guilt to keep Michael in the church. Isn't and I'm that like, weird? Dude, this can't be real. <laughs> Why would religious people use guilt to do anything? <laughs> I wrote uh, in, in, in regards to Michael's character, I wrote, I love this dude's I got a stick up my ass attitude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's just he's just a Lego figure come to some sort of half life. I'm sure he's a very nice gentleman. Oh, I ha I have no doubt. But yes. um, he's he just also not has no my emotion. Priest. Yeah, he has no, no emotion and no. very little. Um, what's the? F I lost the word. He doesn't put a lot of emphasis on words when he speaks. He's monotone. Yes, that's what you want it, from your uh, guy carrying the movie next to Anthony Hopkins. <laughs> right? <laughs> Shit. Uh, but yeah, I guess my, my big thing was it just got super predictable as soon as it was time for the, the big uh, climax of the movie where he was going to get the devil out of um, frickin' uh, Anthony Hopkins, much like people try to exercise him out of every woman, but they fail. <laughs> But uh, I, I just, I just, it just hit all these notes that I saw coming, and I did not enjoy that. But I watch a lot of slasher movies, so who the hell am I to talk? Like, <laughs> I watch nothing but formulaic shit all the time, anyway. So, not really a, a true criticism for me. I think I would have enjoyed the ending of the film better if Anthony Hopkins' character had just decided, you know what, I really enjoy being possessed. And then we could have had like a weird kind of spiritual sequel to To the Devil, A Daughter. Where, the, where the nun is just like, nope, devil baby, fuck yes, let's do this. Could have been a sequel, could have been a road movie, could like him just running around slapping kids. <laughs> <laughs> just following Raffi around on tour. <laughs> Oh my god! I don't know what made me think of it. it. Just popped into my head. Have you ever seen the ABBA movie from like seventy four? Yeah, like seventy six, seventy seven. No, I have not. It's uh, it's the one where this uh, it's on it's, it's an Australian film, and the big thing is that ABBA is going to play in Australia, 
and the the conceit or is that the word I'm looking for is that uh, an, a, an Australian reporter for this tiny little radio station is trying to get an exclusive interview with Abba, so he's running around trying to get backstage at all of their Australian dates, and it's but it's just a concert film with these little comic interludes with this freaking dude. <laughs> for some reason, you talk about him following Rafi around. This is made Barry, me think of that. Is it Barry Humphreys? Please tell me it's Barry Humphreys in the Alba movie. <laughs> I don't know. I can find out. <laughs> it's just called Abba the Movie. Oh, my God. I remember newspaper ads for that, Richard, but I never did because, you know. <laughs> yeah, why? Why would you watch Why would I, I do I, that? It was someone named uh, Robert Hughes. So you could say it's Robert Humphreys. Okay, let's just go with that then. It was just Dame Edna following Abba around. That seems great to me. <laughs> oh, man. Um, hey, do me a favor and please enlighten our listeners as to where they can find your many entertaining offerings because you do many things. You are a man of many talents. I am nothing if not effluviant, which I think means gassy, but... <laughs> Uh, you can find me at uh, Hello, This is the Doomed Show is on uh, legionpodcast.com uh, or go to Doomed bleh, what is that word? DoomedMovieThon.com where you can locate uh, my freaking Twitter handle and my video channel on the YouTubing and also I got some books on Amazon.com. Look for Richard Glenn Schmidt. You can read my Giallo book called Giallo Meltdown and some other things I did. I haven't gotten my temporary tattoos, which are just Brad with his uh, House of the Devil tattoo. (laughs) Those haven't come in yet, but we're working on them. Cool. Richard, thank you so much for picking up the landline of the dam. Please stay on the line because I want to ask the ethereal operator to reverse the charges. Well, yeah, thank you for calling. I was kind of not prepared for this with notes after a discussion like that i not only want to drink i have i sort of need to drink (laughs) (laughs) well i imagine there are some other people out there in the listening audience who also require some alcoholic relief but are still intrigued enough to watch the rot then let us help those people watch the rot and get beanpole hammered at the same time with a rousing round of drinking with the devil, where your love of bad movies meets your disdain for your own liver. Michael chooses not to show emotion. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Drink every time Michael mentions he doesn't know what he believes. <laughs> That's a lot. Uh, Drink every time entire scenes are in Italian. Oh, Jesus. No way, because I have to say, the first time we tried to watch this movie, we saw a version that didn't have fucking subtitles, and we were like, I don't know what the fuck's going on. They've been talking in Italian for ten... I don't speak Italian. They've been doing this for ten fucking minutes. So, yeah, (laughs) do that. Just drink. (laughs) Drink every time Anthony Hopkins looks like he's lost his wallet. He does kind of have that meerkat look all the way through the movie, doesn't he? He does. He's just twitchy. <laughs> Jesus. Drink. Every time Michael has flashbacks of his dead mother. Oh, boy. Drink for every frog that you see. Jesus Christ, cootie bug. <laughs> God. Well, I apologize to everybody who died listening to this game and trying to play along. Fuck me. <laughs> All right, the Grandmaster Challenge. Drink every time Anthony Hopkins refuses to pause between sentences. <laughs> yeah, we're going to put some people under the table with yeah, this Yeah, this is going to be bad. Um, mm. 
What is the number for the CDC? We should just go ahead. Or poison control. <laughs> we should just go ahead. <laughs> oh. Give people a heads up. He drank four bottles of Aqua Velva. We don't know what. He was listening to some goddamn internet show. Oh, my God. Please, please understand that we do not condone underage drinking or alcohol abuse in any way. However, they've, they've always, always worked, worked for us. us. Well, now that we're all good and soused, it's time for us to answer all those questions you have sent in. And thank you, by the way, for doing that. It's time for the country's favorite game of reciprocal interrogation and the relaying of information. Ask the GOAT where we answer your questions and you question our answers. While Cootie rummages through the malevolent mailbag. Rummage, rummage, rummage. Please note that. Wait. Now, did you get these letters from Stephanie? Yeah. I mean, one of her chores is to fill the malevolent mailbag. Where the hell was she keeping the letters before she put them in the mailbag? I don't have any way of knowing that. Oh, they smell funny. I, I do not have an explanation for that. Jesus, and this one is stained. <laughs> Please note that you can reach us via three separate means of communication. The easiest way is to join the Kiss the Goat group on Facebook. Well, you're probably on Facebook anyway, so you might as well just book your face with us. Why wouldn't you? Join the group, post a question, and we'll get around to answering it eventually. God, is this blood? Is there blood on this envelope? You can also send us an email with your question to thegoatofmadness at gmail.com. Hell, it doesn't even have to be topped out. Just use your little phone thingy there and send us an audio message. That seems fun now, doesn't it? There's a sticky note in here that says burn in hell X. I am pretty sure that's Stephanie's handwriting. Finally, you can follow Kiss the Goat on Twitter. Look. There are a lot of Twitter accounts out there called Kiss the Goat. I know. I've looked. We tried to get back into our old Twitter account, but someone else had already taken the username. Or maybe we took theirs. I don't know. Uh, Rodrigo Green. That's the guy who's got oh, the sucker. Kiss the Goat account. Anyway, don't be fooled by pale imitations. Look for the Kiss the Goat logo on Twitter at the Goat of M-A-D-N-E and the number one. And if that's not the dumbest Twitter handle in the world, I'll kiss your ass on Town Square at high noon. Cootie, what's our first question? Oh, God, hang on. Just let let me get some hand sanitizer going on here, okay? You know, there are latex gloves in the nightstand beside my bed. Yeah, I'm probably going to need them. Um, okay, so our first question comes from Rolf Pickler. Hi, Rolf. Rolf says, in honor of KTG's glorious return, I'm going to revisit one of the very first questions I remember asking you. Does everything go better when you add a little satanic ritual abuse to it? Well, I mean, some things are already, you know, inherently abused, like <laughs> a hamburger helper. That's already just like a, a crime in a box, so maybe not that. Other things? Sure. Why not? I say yes, as long as there's consent. Well, if it's ritual abuse, there's no consent. Well, then fuck that noise. Well, then we just need Hamburger Helper, don't we? No. I don't have your consent to make Hamburger Helper? You do not. This didn't answer shit for you, Rolf, and I'm very, very <laughs> sorry about that. The Angry Ginger, Matt Tangent himself, wants to know, what do you think Satan's favorite sex position is? I'm guessing missionary, as he definitely appreciate the sacrilegious nature of it. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely missionary. Um, I think he'd also get a kick out of reverse cowgirl just because of the implied sort of uh, bestiality there. I sort of think that he would like doggy style just because, if anything, the devil likes to do it backwards. <laughs> Bandingo. Well, let's get into a double shot of questions from Chris Mounts. Hi, Chris. First thing Chris wants to know is... Twin Temple, great satanic doo-wop band, or greatest satanic doo-wop band? Now, you knew about Twin Temple before I did. Fucking love Twin Temple. Actually, I love what I've heard of Twin Temple. Um, I follow Claire Burgess on Instagram, and they created a fucking Halloween playlist on Spotify back in October. Had, like five or six Twin Temple songs on it. Fantastic. Made me giggle every time they came on the playlist. Um, so, yeah, but I don't really... 
doo-wop band doo-wop is not the 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 genre that i think of when i hear twin temple they've got kind of this interesting um like jazzy sort of feel like they don't belong in this decade i'm not even sure if jazzy's what i'd go with i think they're more of a surf rock band than anything else they remind me of surf rock uh, yeah well southern culture on the skids or the cramps something like that however i think lyrically they embrace their you know belief system more than other bands that I've heard. I mean, that whole I Am a Witch song was like, I do magic naked and I hex the patriarchy. <laughs> you know, Fantastic. It's fucking great, but I can also hear drive-by truckers doing a similar song. So, okay. that's just me. Maybe I just don't, maybe I don't know what doo-wop is. Maybe I don't want to know what doo-wop <laughs> is. <laughs> So I think doo-wop, I think, oh, God, that's the shit that Billy Joel tried to pull off back in the 80s. And that innocent yeah. man shit didn't work. Um, Chris, the second question is, which is greater, the Church of Satan or the Satanic Temple? Does this fall to me to answer? Well, if you have an answer, otherwise I can jump in on this. Um, I really, I I confess ignorance, Chris, and and. It, shame on your high priestess for this um but i don't know i is it as far as i know the church of satan is the um kind of the group that i know of that's been kind of active or at least outspoken politically as far as like um human rights am i correct in that x no that's the satanic temple oh well i've got that completely reversed yeah. so fuck the satanic me. temple is the ones that have been like you know we need to do satanic prayers at city council meetings, and we're having satanic daycare after school and stuff like that. They've got kind of their own version of Alcoholics Anonymous called the Sober Faction, which is really cool and probably not something I would ever join because, hi, have you met me? But the Church of Satan is more like 70s Anton LaVey, I've got a pet tiger and a stripper in the basement sort of thing so i think well i'm sure that has its merits too <laughs> i'm sure it does <laughs> i hope the tiger's named kissy lips um so i think right now the satanic temple is greater in their outreach and in their impact on social media and um, politics on a smaller town level i reckon or maybe a you know medium market like Detroit, whereas the Church of Satan, I think, is what most people think of when they think of uh, the satanic panic or that one time that, uh, I'm going to get his last name wrong, Aguilar, Michael from the Temple of Set, he was on Phil Donahue one time and he looked like Spock's dad talking about... <laughs> Talking about, you know, how their how their belief system works. But I think I'm sad I missed that. I'm gonna have to look it up now. You can YouTube that shit. I'm sure. I'm sure. But um, I think the Satanic Temple has more of a positive effect than the Church of Satan did. Yeah, I mean, you know, Anton Lavey was a he crazy was just, drugged out motherfucker. Just a wacky showman who liked to play the pipe organ and wished he was in the circus whereas the satanic temple is like um no we really need to have some equanimity here in this alaskan city council meeting where everything gets opened up with a christian prayer and that's bullshit so that's what i think i think satanic temple is probably greater but the church of satan is scarier <laughs> Well, Gary Hill over at Cinema Beef Podcast and Two Drink Minimum Commentaries and, uh, fuck, I don't know, 300 other shows, sends in this question. Gary wants to know, do you think Satan is so grumpy because of the lack of sweets in the underworld? I mean, no chocolate because it would melt, <laughs> as would the gummies. What would be a decadent treat that would please our Lord Satan that would maintain its composure in the high temperatures of hell? An everlasting gobstopper. Fuck, yes. Because, you know, it's eternal candy, and it's it's shaped like the fucking COVID-19 cell, so that shit ain't going away anytime soon. And I think at some point... I don't know. I'm probably on. It doesn't taste like roast beef. I'm sorry. That's the gum. But 
I got I got my Wonka treats messed up. <clears throat> but I think if it's an everlasting gobstopper, and if hell is eternal, then Satan should have at least one for him, and he should taunt other demons with it. And be like, would you like a lick? Oh, no, sorry. Uh, please put this poker up somebody's sphincter. Jesus, that's a great answer. I was thinking something shitty, like fucking Nico wafers, you know, the stuff that's going to be around with cockroaches after the apocalypse. Dude, or a now and later? Yeah. Those things will just pull the fillings out your teeth. Yep. I mean, they're hard to eat. You've got to put that shit in the microwave and then call a priest. <laughs> Literally, I had a feeling pulled out of one of my back teeth as a kid with the fucking now and later candy. See, that's just, that's evil. So there's evil candy, which is the now and laters, and then there's the eternally damned candy, which is the everlasting gobstopper. (laughs) So this works. There is candy in hell. We just proved it. Mike Tutino checks in with this query. Assuming such a thing were possible... What human being walking the earth today would surprise you the least if they revealed themselves to be old scratch? Donald Trump. That was absolutely my first thought. (laughs) I mean, even biblically so far, he is filling the role of the Antichrist. You know, we thought he was dead. Motherfucker came back from Walter Reed. Um, So, yeah, Trump is definitely up there. (laughs) But there's got to be somebody else besides Trump, because I think that's... That's a good answer, but I think most people would think that. Probably obvious. You know, it wouldn't surprise me if Vince McMahon was Satan. Oh. (laughs) Yeah, me too, neither. That's good shit, pal. Yeah. No. Because screw that guy and his business practices from hell to breakfast. I just can't. (laughs) Can't stand him. So it's Trump or McMahon, and they're both on the same side? Yep. Well, our final question has been reserved for this wild inquiry from Vanessa McHenry from the VD Clinic podcast. You know, Vanessa either loves us or hates us. I can't tell. But Vanessa wants to know, who makes a better goat sound, X or Cootie? And you know this is going to require each of you to demonstrate your goat-like abilities. Are you fucking kidding? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my gods. All right. <sighs> Have you another drink? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to. I'm going to need it before I start doing goat noises. <laughs> All right. I don't know how to do this. I, have pra- I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Jesus, that sounds like fucking Uncle Fester. <laughs> I was thinking it sounded like a constipated goat. That was pretty good. <laughs> Is that a problem with goats? I've never oh, owned no. a goat. Okay, now you got to go. You got to do yours. <laughs> I don't know if I can. Hang on. Don't leave me hanging, Cootie. God damn. <laughs> <laughs> See, I don't know. What's the difference between a goat and a sheep? I've never raised livestock. They sound the same to me. <laughs> I think I think sheep are more nervous. <laughs> Can't we just throw out Black Phillip quotes with that would that qualify? No. No, no that's okay. not the I mean that's a goat sentence, not a goat noise. You gotta be like <laughs> Jesus, gods. <laughs> I sound like Trigger when he was being stuffed. <laughs> you sound like me when I'm being stuffed. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, this episode of Kiss the Goats just about finished. However, let me encourage all of you listening to become a legionnaire. Now, what we mean by that is that you should subscribe to the Legion Podcast's YouTube channel. Not only will you get some fine programming from other shows on the Legion Podcast Network, you'll also get access to some live videos where some of your favorite Legion Podcast content providers talk about movies and whatever else organically evolves from their twisted minds. And there are even more shows to listen to when you join the Legion Podcast Patreon. Exclusive material that may never see the light of day publicly. Early show releases. Maybe somebody will take off their shirt. 
maybe somebody <laughs> won't take off their shirt, and that may be worth money. I mean, I get naked for free, but nobody out there wants that kind of action. <laughs> Make Kiss the Goat one of your favorite shows on your media platform of choice and never miss a new episode. I mean, why would you miss a KTG episode? That would make you sad. Don't be sad. Hey, until next time, my name is X. And I'm Cootie. Hail Satan. Oh, fuck, Vanessa. That would hurt. <laughs> yep. That was, that was something special. Oh. <sighs>